Good morning and welcome everyone. It's great to have each and every one of you with us. We're so excited to give praise this morning with all of you and sing about how we are free. We are free because Jesus died for us and that is so amazing. So would you please stand and join us. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Sing your praise to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and melodious song, with trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn. Make a joyful symphony before the Lord, the King. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the earth and all living things join in. Let the rivers clap their hands in glee. Let the hills sing out their songs of joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice and the nations with fairness. In a faith, rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You are strong.
Sing to the east and the west, Jesus, who Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth, we will shout to the north and the south. who's worthy uh, for a shout, for us to give a full response, um, to not hold anything back, God, because you are the greatest treasure that our hearts uh, can ever know. Uh, so we pray, Lord, as our hearts still wrestle to know that and fully receive that, that you would change us in this time of worship. Reveal yourself um, in such a way that uh, we're moved, that our lives will not be the same. Um, because of knowing you. And we do this, God, we pray. It's all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy, happy Donut Sunday. Yes. 
Um, welcome. We're glad you're here. I'm so glad to see all of you this morning. If you're visiting, if you're new with us, um, thanks for coming. We're glad you're here. Uh, we hope you feel welcome, and, um, and we're excited that you're, uh, you decided to join us this morning. My name is Doug Betts. I'm the youth and children's pastor here, and I just want to go through a few things, just some reminders. Um, first of all, be sure to check out your bulletin. There is so much going on in our church and our community, and God is really working in a lot of ways. Um, so lots of opportunities for us. So uh, a few things to remind you of our annual vision sharing meeting will be Sunday, January 21st at noon, right after church. We'll have a pot blessing followed by a meeting, which will look at vision sharing, um, an opportunity to review annual reports, and just look at where we're at as far as a church on mission. Uh, there will be child care provided for that, so that will be taken care of. So I encourage you to, uh, to attend and just see where we're at and where we're headed. Um, we'd like to remind everybody we have a meals ministry, which is a ministry that essentially reaches out to folks um, in particular who maybe have had a recent hospital stay or, or illness or challenges of that nature just to help provide a meal for them. Um, that's a, an incredible ministry that uh, they're, they're, we're in need of some volunteers to help with that. But what an opportunity that is to serve and to reach out and to make an impact for the love um, for, for love, for the love of Christ to, to others. And just a, an opportunity to really reach out. And I can tell you, and, and those that have experienced it know um, how important that is and, and how much uh, that really matters. So I want to encourage you, um, if you, if you feel so led, to, to be a part of that meals ministry. You can visit with one of the pastors. Um, or Tracy Anders is in charge of that. You can talk with her as well. Um, Boost Ministries has a praise and worship night coming up on Sunday, January 28th. That will be at the First United Methodist Church, but everyone is invited to attend. Um, many of you probably are familiar with Boost. It, it kind of started as a women's ministry, but it is e evolving. It's growing. Um, men and, and even youth now are, are becoming a part of that ministry and some different things. A lot of exciting things going on um, in that ministry as well. So um, there's more information on that in the bulletin. Also, uh, Ryan Foley of Covenant Eyes is speaking tonight on internet pornography. Um, he's got a message titled, Equipping Parents for an Ongoing Conversation. And again, that's tonight at 6.30 at the St. John's High School gym. Um, I know parents, I know that's kind of a, an awkward and sometimes difficult subject to tackle. Um, but I, I promise you, I know it's an important one as well. So I'd encourage you, if you're available, to attend that tonight at, uh, at the St. John's uh, gym at 6.30. And then uh, Women's World is a is having a conference i know many women here have gone to that in the past it's uh, the conference title in the eye of the storm is february 23rd and 24th in manhattan and and i know many of you have gone in the past um, if you're interested if you'd like more information there's information out at the welcome center um, you can also talk to chris miller i know in the past they've done some carpooling and, and some different things there so there's opportunities there as well um, and then clash which is our children's ministry um, we'll be starting up on January 31st. Uh, there are sign-up sheets for students out at the Welcome Center also. But I also want to encourage um, any of you who feel called to serve possibly in that area, um, still in need of, of some potential leaders. Um, but also we plan to feed the students um, each night at 530, each Wednesday at 530. Um, so if you feel uh, led in some way to serve in that, whether that's you know, actually serving, whether that's you know, cooking, preparing, um, possibly through donation, whatever it may be. Just if you want to visit with me, I'd love to talk with you about it and kind of see where that uh, where that ministry may go. Um, Fusion, our junior high and high school students will meet again Wednesday, and this week we're going to look at our walk of faith. Every one of us are somewhere in a walk in relation to God, um, and, and we're going to talk about where we're at on that and and how we can can get on the path and and keep heading towards Him as quickly as possible. Um, and then finally, Kids Church, we have Kids Church every, uh, virtually every morning during the second service, which is for any, any uh, kindergartners through fourth grade. So if we have any of those guys and you want to come up here, we're going to head out here just shortly and we'll go up to the youth room. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about a, a man in the Bible whose name is Stephen. And uh, we got a story to tell about Stephen today. Uh, Stephen had incredible faith. In fact, the gospel, the truth of Jesus was so important to him that he was willing to die so that people would know that. And we're going to talk about that today. So um, I would encourage you again um, for more information. Like I said, there's a lot of things going on in our church and our community. Um, you can check out the bulletin. You can visit our website or follow us on Facebook. Thanks.
Have you ever tried to log on to an account of yours online on a website and you forgot your password? Even if you remember your password, if you don't type it in correctly, if you misspell it, it won't work. I've done that and I'm sure many of you have also. It can be very frustrating because if you have multiple attempts to try to sign on and you're unsuccessful, sometimes you'll be totally locked out. And the system will tell you you have to go where somewhere to meet with people in person to be recertified or reapproved to log on to your own account. I'm thankful God does not require me to remember a password before I pray. Uh, let's consider the truth of God's word uh, from Psalm 66, 18 through 20, as we prepare for our prayer time, in which it says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened, and he has heard my prayer. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. What can we learn from these words from Psalm 66? In this passage, the psalmist says that unconfessed sin can block my prayers to God. But when we confess our sins, God has surely listened and heard our prayers. He has not rejected our prayers, the psalmist said. God has not withheld his love for us. God does not give us a busy signal or hang up or lock us out of our prayer account. Therefore, we can have confidence when we pray that he will listen to our prayers. This is a powerful motivation for us to pray. We already have prayer joys and concerns that were shared in our earlier service. We'll include those during our prayer time together as a church family. And we have prayer cards that have been turned in that we will include. We also have things that have been turned in verbally to the pastoral staff that we'll include during our prayer time. But we welcome the things that you would share. Joys, concerns, and especially testimonies about what God is doing in and through your life and the lives of other people. Whatever's on your heart, we want to pray together as a church family. What would you share as a prayer, joy, or concern, or testimony today? We welcome the things that are on your heart. Yes. We'll pray for that situation. That doesn't sound very comforting, and uh, we'll pray for God's help for that situation with uh, Austin's tooth. Thank you for sharing that. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies. We welcome the thanks. Angela. We'll pray for all those situations. That's a, a lot of things to be happening in your family tree, and we just need to acknowledge that God's help is needed, and thank you for sharing that. Yes. We'll continue to pray for her, and she certainly had a battle. Uh, we uh, pray for God's uh, wisdom and uh, his help for all that uh, is concerning her. Thank you for sharing that. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies? Yes, fellas. God bless you. God bless you. That's neat. Uh, we're happy for you, and uh, we'll continue to pray for his provision and protection in the future also. I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a minute. George.
continue to pray for him and uh, it sounds like he's going to have ongoing concerns so uh, thanks for that update I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a minute with a pattern of prayer following the letters of the word ACTS, A-C-T-S, in which uh, A represents adoration or praise to God, C represents confession, T represents thanks, and S represents supplication or praying for others. I'll offer some suggestions as I'm praying, but I want you to pray in your own heart however God leads you. Join me in your hearts as we pray together. As I'm praying, I invite you to express your own adoration or praise to God in your own heart, however he prompts you. Thank you for your power, protection, and provision, God. We are committed to you. We surrender to you. We worship to you as the only creator, sustainer, and giver of all life. Blessed be God. You're amazing. You are God alone. You're the wonderful creator. No wonder we worship you. No wonder we praise you. Praise God. Praise God. We move on in our prayers to a time to focus on confession. I invite you to talk to God in your own heart about your own life, however he prompts you. God, we pray seeking your forgiveness and healing. Psalm 66 reminds us that if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. That's why we need to spend time reviewing our need for confession and repentance. Lord, we do need your help. We are helpless and hopeless on our own. Therefore, we pray and we repent and confess our sins and seek your healing, mercy, and grace. Lord, thank you for your shed blood on the cross for each of us. As we continue on our prayers to a time to focus on giving thanks, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart thanking him for whatever he prompts you to thank him for. Thank you, God, for this church family and the opportunity to share together on our spiritual journey. Help us to be unified and support one another, for each one is valuable and significant and important. Thank you for the many small group opportunities and classes and gatherings to help people grow. We thank you for the new uh, Discover BFCC class and that many are able to benefit from that study. Lord, uh, we thank you in anticipation of the uh, meal and annual meeting and vision time next Sunday. We pray many would be able to benefit from that. We pray and give you thanks for the weekend to remember marriage programs coming up in the near future in Kansas City and many places around the country. Bless folks who can take advantage of those opportunities. We pray for the Women's World uh, event in uh, Manhattan uh, coming February 23rd and 24th, bless many by that program. And for the boost, uh, praise and worship time, bless it, we pray. We rejoice with uh, Phyllis Behrens for the good news from her doctor. Uh, that's very, very neat to get a, a cancer-free uh, declaration, and we pray that you continue to show yourself uh, strong on her behalf and for her health. As we move on in our prayer time to a time of supplication or praying for others, I invite you to pray in your own heart, praying for others, however he prompts you. God, we pray along with George and Judy uh, for Gail Nielsen in Arizona as he continues to have health concerns. Touch him and help him, we pray. We pray along with Leanne Wehrman for her cousin, little Harper, that uh, the doctors have changed their mind on what's needed, and we pray for wisdom and strength and medical expertise to help her in her struggle. We pray along with Angela for uh, the two of the kibbies that are in need of, of help, one in the nursing home soon and another that went to the Salina Regional Hospital recently. Be with each of those uh, folks and their uh, wives to help them and strengthen them. Touch them, we pray. We pray along with Vinette for Austin's tooth fracture and for the upcoming surgery and repair. Help him, we pray. Uh, be with him, we pray. We pray uh, 
along with uh, Sharon Keister for Dave Stevenson as he'll be at KU Med Center for surgery in the near future. We uh, pray along with uh, Kylie Mim as she uh, has the opportunity to join the National Guard early in the near future in uh, Kansas City. We pray for all the details related to that transition for her and her steps of uh, planning for the future. We pray for Paul Whipple as uh, he's not doing well in hospice care. They've asked for no visitors. Uh, be with him and strengthen him and his family. We thank you uh, for the medical help that Zeb Larson received through surgery last week, and we pray for wisdom for Zeb and his family and the doctors as they consider what's next in his particular situation. Help him, we pray. We pray for Dan Stride as he has back problems. We pray along with Greg Harrison for Beth Harrison as she's at home with knee problems and waiting for medical help and possible surgery in the future. Help her, we pray. We pray for Gerald Briney as he's been in the hospital recently. Be with Rod Pearson as he recovers after having uh, been treated for pneumonia. Be with Rob Heller as he continues recovery at home with daily uh, hospital outpatient treatment, uh, needing rides for this daily treatment and meals on certain days to help with his family situation. Uh, help volunteers to help them, we pray. We pray for Dan Reeling as he continues his recovery after ankle and foot surgery as he's at the Derby Health and Rehab Center in uh, Derby, Kansas. Help him, we pray. We uh, pray uh, for uh, Eric Cadle, uh, giving thanks that he had successful surgery and pray for his healing and recovery. Pray for Julie Overmiller as she continues to battle cancer. Be with her. Be with Beverly James as she recovers after knee surgery. Help her, we pray. We pray for Pastor Cliff, that you would fill him, use him, anoint him, allow him to be a channel of your truth, and may your spirit be present to touch the heart of each one who hears that we may sense your prompting on how we can practically apply your truth to each of us on our spiritual journey. We also want to remember the families of those who have experienced passing of loved ones, and we pray for the family of Carol Trickett as her funeral was January 12th. Send comfort and peace, we pray. We pray for the family of she Meyer, as her uncle passed away and she was providing care, I send comfort and peace to that family. And for the family of David Sumter, as his funeral will be January 16th, we pray for the family of Fred Kennington as he passed away yesterday, January 13th. For each of these families, send comfort and peace and prompt us as your tools to be prompted in whatever way you would guide us to reach out to any of these families to support and encourage them in this time of loss and adjustment for each of them. We pray all these things in the blessed name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. We are now at our time in our worship service where we celebrate communion. We would just ask that uh, anyone who is a believer in Jesus, that they can participate with in, communion, in communion with us today. You don't have to be a member of our church to do that. We would just ask that you would hold the bread and juice, uh, and uh, we will take it all together as a church family. Our scripture today is from Galatians 4, 4 to 7. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that we might receive the full rights as sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. Myself, I'm not much of a philosopher or a theoretical thinker. You know, and so the idea of God actually adopting me into his family is kind of hard for me to really understand. You know, in my, the way I look at myself, I think, you know, maybe he might take me in as a second cousin someplace down the line, and, but not as a son. And I think, you know, of all the things I've not done that would have been pleasing to him, but you know, it also says that he, he doesn't remember your sins, and as far as the east is from the west, he takes those sins away from us. And so 
as I uh, thought about that and I thought about, you know, how, how does God make me into a son and how do I become a stepbrother of Jesus? Well, one thing that's changed in my life recently has kind of helped me to understand that. My uh, oldest son, uh, Joe, and his uh, wife, Samantha, for the last two years have been taking in foster children, and they've had five foster kids that they've cared for over the last two years. And one young boy by the name of Liam, they have had him for 15 months now. And they are in the process, if, if it's possible, that they're going to adopt him. And you know how things go with state governments. It's really hard to get that done. It just takes lots of time and effort and money and a lot of obstacles to overcome to make it work. But, you know, the thing about it is Mary and I already consider Liam to be our grandson. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we really love him and we want the best for him no matter what. And, uh, you know, we make it a priority now to get out of Beloit and go spend time with him that we wouldn't have done otherwise. And hopefully someday he will actually be one of our official heirs. But this relationship with Liam has really helped me to understand how God can love me enough that he wants to include me in his family. And even though I've done nothing to earn this, and I really don't have any special abilities that would make him take a second look at me, God has generously invited me to become his adopted son. And all I have to do is accept God's free gift of salvation by believing in Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for my sin. So I would urge each of you, if you haven't made that decision, that you would take advantage of that today. But you wouldn't wait, but you would really take advantage of God's offer because it's there and it's free for you. So let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you for adopting us into your family. Even though we don't do anything to deserve it, you just offer it because of your great love for us. And we just... Thank you for dying on the cross for us and making this possible. And we just uh, just pray for your uh, help that if there's anybody here that hasn't accepted Jesus, that they would just uh, feel your hand and your presence in their heart, that that would change their minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
the Gospel of Luke. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Our offering meditation is from Proverbs 22, 9, which says, A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. In this verse, God gives us a promise. If I am generous and share with those people in need, then I will be blessed. This does not necessarily promise me that I'm going to be materially wealthy, but it does mean that God is going to have a greater presence in my life, I will have deeper relationships with people around me, and I will have, obviously, more personal peace and contentment. God always keeps his promises, and if I am generous, I can rest assured that he will bless me as he has promised. So let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you for your blessing, the blessings of being part of this church, for having Christian friends to fellowship with, and most of all, for allowing me to be in a relationship with you. And we just ask you to help us to have generous hearts and to really look for people in need that we can be generous towards. For your pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah, thank you, praise team. And good morning, church. Hey, you guys look fantastic again today. Thanks for taking the time and energy to come on out. Um, I appreciated uh, uh, Pastor Dave mentioning about forgetting passwords. Um, I, some of my places actually get suspicious if I get my password right the first time because they're like, well, that can't be Cliff. He never gets that the first time. But we're actually going to talk about identity today. And we want to look at a text from the book of Exodus. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to follow in your own Bible. We will have it on the screen here. We're in a series that we just started last week. So let me give you quick background as we start chapter 2. We're going to look at Exodus 2, 1 through 22 today. And the background is that um, this series is we're going to watch how God takes his people, the Israelites, Hebrews, who are enslaved in Egypt, and he's going to free them. And he's going to do that um, on a couple of different levels that we're going to look at in this series. But what we note here is that in the first chapter, we got the background of how Israel has um, been living in Egypt. But over time, one of the pharaohs, the king of Egypt, had decided that they were becoming a threat to him. And so he started in a systematic way of trying a, a kind of genocide, really, of killing them off, but doing it at first in kind of an underhanded, uh, behind-the-scenes way. So he tried to do it with just oppression, um, with slavery that had harsh, bitter labor uh, attached to it, such that he thought that would kill them off over time. That didn't happen. God was good and blessed them even in that hard time that they were experiencing. He tried to get Hebrew midwives to kill infant boy babies at birth um, and kind of make it look like it was a natural death, a stillborn of some kind, and that in that way he could somehow kill off uh, these Israelites. When that didn't work, he now went to, at the end of chapter 1, a full-blown scale where everyone was called to be involved with taking Hebrew boys that were born and throwing them into the Nile River to kill them. And so as he's done this, he's spread this on a very large scale. It also, though, awakens the compassion and the concern of many people, and we're going to see in this chapter someone who you would least expect um, but Moses gets his beginning here. So let me read this, 1 through 22. Remember, this is God's word. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch, and then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And so the girl went off and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. And so the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out, and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, 
where he sat down by a well. And now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Reuel, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? And they answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Reuel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. And Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. And Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Let's take a moment to pray. <clears throat> Lord, be with us in such a way that we can hear your voice, that as we um, think about and look at this text, that uh, you would speak into our lives. Um, we always ask this, Lord, because it depends on you. But we also know that um, we want to present ourselves. We want to um, put down our defenses, open ourselves up to you. So would you take us as we are, speak to us and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going to talk about identity here today, and we're going to look at how, um, to begin, how our identity gets distorted. Um, but I first I need to congratulate you because there... In these 22 verses, you just covered over 40 years of biblical history, just in those 22 verses. That's right. If you blinked, a lot of that happened between verse 10 and 11, where it says that Moses grew up, and growing up is hard. <laughs> growing up is really, really difficult, um, because as you grow up, there is this dynamic of trying to figure out who you are. Um, and usually do that in the context of some kind of a family um, unit, people around you, a mother, a father, or an extended family trying to figure out, well, I guess this is who I belong to, but what's my place in this family? So our identity usually begins by just trying to find out how do we fit in the family that I've been born into. And sometimes there's a lot of studies done on these sorts of things, and people kind of figure out their identity based on where they're born. I mean, so... Uh, those of you who have siblings, do we have any oldest born here today? You, you are the oldest amongst your siblings, okay? Well, everybody knows that you're the favorites, you know, that your parents favored the oldest born, you know, because we all know that. I mean, when your pacifier fell, your parents burned it and bought you new ones, and everybody else, you know, they just wiped it off and gave it to them. Anybody here, you're the youngest amongst your siblings in your families, right? See, everybody knows you guys are spoiled, right? Because... <laughs> Because as you went along life, you got to do things that your older siblings are like, oh, Mom and Dad never let me do that. I, what? They're just tired. They just got so tired after a while that you got away with murder, right? Those of you who are um, any middle, middle children here today? Yeah. See, God loves us the best. I just want you to know. Because we're always overlooked, right? We don't fit in any kind of form or anything. But usually we're, we're in a family unit. We're trying to figure out where do I fit? What's my identity within the family? Am I the student? Am I the athlete? Am I the funny one? Am I the, the, the person who's always caring or giving? All these different scenarios we look at. Then it gets more complicated because then we get out into the world and then we're trying to figure out, yeah, what's my identity even beyond my family? Who, who am I? Moses has a double challenge here because he doesn't just come from one family unit but really two. Um, he is born an Israelite, a Hebrew, but he is, for the first probably scholars think three or four years when um, his sister says, I'll get my, his mother to, to nurse him for three. It's really about three or four years, not the nursing, but that they take care in those formative years. So they think he's with his actual um, real parents, his physical um, parents' um, family for the first three or four years. But then at some point, he's handed over to the daughter of Pharaoh, one of Pharaoh's daughters. Now, he would have had many, many daughters, but one of Pharaoh's daughters, which now means that Moses is brought out of a Hebrew culture, out of an identity that's formed and shaped, especially in those early years of we are a people. 
We are a people of the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We are a people that have a promise attached to us. He's taken out of that, and now he's raised in a household with tremendous privileges. He, he truly is a prince of Egypt. He belongs to Pharaoh's daughter, and now he is raised. And by the way, I put this in your, your, your uh, bulletin so you can look at this later. There's two other passages in the New Testament that give us a little bit of insight into what we read today, into Moses' thinking and motivation. Acts chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 11. You can look at those later. But in, in Acts 7, we're told that Moses was actually raised with all of the wisdom of Egypt. And, and he had power and might in his speaking. And he was raised as an Egyptian prince, someone who had position and authority and was taught how to use it. And so you have Moses, who comes from two different families then, trying to sort out as he grows up, but, but who am I really? What, what's my identity? And as he struggles to figure that out, I think in one part uh, we, we learn that Moses, I think this is in Hebrews 11, where it says that Moses does not want to be identified as Egyptian. He, he somewhere in our, in our verses where he grows up determines I know I have all of the trappings of an Egyptian. He probably looks like an Egyptian because when he gets later into Midian, they mistake him as an Egyptian. He has all of the cultural attachments of looking like an Egyptian, sounding like an Egyptian, walking like an Egyptian, all of those things that he can do. But he knows in his heart, that's not who I want to be. I want to be with my people. And our text multiple times says when he sees other Hebrews, other Israelites, he says, my people, I am a Jew, I'm an Israelite, I'm Hebrew. And he forsakes, he pushes aside, I don't want to be Egyptian. He wants to be Hebrew. He doesn't want to be Egyptian, but he's really not quite sure how to get there. How do I do that? Well, one thing that becomes clear and sometimes people will say, this is your starting point for identity. They'll say, what's your passion? I mean, really, what, what's in your heart that you desire, you love to do? And a lot of times people will say, your identity is going to be wrapped up with that. So that if you can figure out what you love to do, then pursue it. Well, from our text, you can tell something that Moses loves to do. Moses loves to be a kind of a leader, uh, a rescuer. Someone who, when he sees something that is wrong, an injustice, you don't have to tell him. There's something wired, I think hardwired actually, by God into Moses that says, I just can't let that be. It's, it's good enough for other people maybe just to talk about it and to say how horrible it is, but I have got to act on it. And in our text alone, you see three different times where Moses is compelled to step in and do something when he sees something is going wrong, where there's an injustice. So it begins first when he sees another Egyptian beating one of the Hebrew slaves. And something in his belly is just, there's a fire there. That he says, this is wrong. There's the oppressor. Here's the oppressed. And I can't just let that go. And at the first opportunity that he gets, he takes that Egyptian and kills him. We see it the second time when he sees two Hebrews arguing and fighting and he wants to be the mediator. He wants to intervene and say, hey, why? Why are you guys hitting each other? Why, why are you fighting? And, and he wants to intervene and, and he wants to mediate and make it all right. And then you see it even later on when he's really becoming a different person. But even there it comes out. He's in a foreign land. He's in the desert wilderness. And he comes to this well. And seven women who are trying to, to water their father's flocks are chased off, they're taken advantage of really by these shepherds and there's something that just kind of boils up inside of Moses and he says, that is wrong, that's an injustice and I can't just let it go and it says that he gets up and he rescues them. There's something in Moses that wants to be kind of the hero rescuer and this I want to say, and get this really clear I think, this is a good desire. So when we say, that you have built in you, I think hardwired into you. The scriptures talk about this in terms of spiritual gifts, in terms of kind of your giftedness, your talents, the things that God has kind of wired into you to do. These are good things. But what happens is, if we take any of the good desires that God builds into us, and then we say, that will be my identity, 
we all as sinners, we have a sinful nature that will take that very good desire and twist it and distort it where it actually does not bring life but brings destruction and death. And so sin would take what seems like a good idea. If I want to figure out who I am, I've got to follow my passions. But when we make it our identity, it will become destructive. Henry Nouwen has said, there's three lies, and this really goes ag- across cultures, which is always interesting to me. Three lies that people have believed regarding identity. And the three lies are this. I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what people say or think about me. He said those three are lies. They don't fulfill, they don't bring to a fulfillment life and peace and joy and righteousness. They bring death. They bring destruction. He says when you believe the lie, I am what I have, he says all of your identity is bound up in possessions and those sorts of things. I would argue in our text here, I think Moses does not have a problem with that first lie because He's got wealth. He's got position as an Egyptian prince. And he's willing to say, no, I don't find fulfillment in my identity with what I have. I can let that go. And we're actually told that he can let go of the riches and wealth of Egyptian life so that he can pursue his identity as a Hebrew. But I do think Moses, like we do, struggles with at least two of those other three. And the two other ones are, I am what I do, and I am what people say or think about me. And I draw that from the fact that he takes action. Moses is like, well, if you want to be as an identity, you know, what's your identity? As a hero, rescuer, how do you go about doing that? I mean, do they, do they have a degree for that up at the tech college? Is there a way I can pursue? I want to be a hero, rescuer. Well, you better start building your resume. And the way you do that is take action. You better start doing things that show people, but see, this is the key, that show people this is who I am. And when Moses does that, it's going to get twisted in a number of different ways. See, I think he's actually counting here for his identity. I'll do these things, but then I need to have people tell me, man, you are an awesome rescuer. You are fantastic at being a leader. That's who you are. And he doesn't get that. In fact, let me read one verse from Acts 7, one of those passages that I said gives some insight on this. Acts 7.25 says this. Moses thought, this is after he's killed the Egyptian and tried to inter, you know, be a mediator for the Hebrews. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. I think because he's not sure who he is, He doesn't know his identity, and he's trying to create it. When we try to create our own identity, we resort to one of those three lies, and and for Moses, it's action. I did this, but now people need to tell me that I did right. And he's trying to, in one hand, he's trying to be a child of God, but he's still thinking like a pagan. He's trying to be a child of God, but what's stopping him from really being a child of God is his thinking which is all wrapped up in these lies. You are what you do. You are what people say about you. And Moses is getting no love here. He's getting no response from people. And he has resorted to the Egyptian way of thinking of how to get it in the first place. So in other words, if you're going to be a great rescuer leader and you see an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew, if you see someone who's doing something wrong, how do you solve that dilemma? How do you intervene as a leader? How are you going to solve that and be a rescuer? The Egyptian way of thinking is this, power trumps everything. Power is the way to do it. Power is the way, and you use intimidation, and if need be, you just kill them. And that's what Moses does. In Moses' mind, how are you going to mediate between two people that you you don't want to kill them because they're one of your own? How do I mediate between one? Well, I, I have to determine who's right and who's wrong. And he speaks to the one who's in the wrong And Moses' mind is the way that you become a great mediator is self-righteousness, position. I'm in a position to tell you who's right and who's wrong. He wants to be a child of God, but he is thinking like an Egyptian, a pagan who doesn't know the true God. And in all of this, he doesn't get any response from the people that he's trying to help. And so he feels lost. I don't know who I am. 
I thought I was a rescuer, but surely they would have said, you are our rescuer, and they're not doing that. Now, on our level, again, I want to tell you, you have desires and passions that God has given you, and they are good. You have to hold on to the fact that these are good desires and passions. And the only problem is when sin, when we want to make them our identity, sin is going to twist them. So some of you in your family, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but if I thought, if I said, in your family units, maybe extended family, is there somebody who kind of, as identity, is the caregiver in your home? I mean, they're the person who, when somebody's hurting, they're the first one there. They're the person who actually does get all of the Christmas cards, and you just sign them, but they make sure that they actually buy them and get them sent out to the right address, and they are keeping the connections with people in your family. They're the caregiver in your life. They're, that's their identity, right? Well, if that becomes their identity, sin will twist it in this way. Such a good desire, and that's a good desire, to care and to connect. Did you know that when sin gets a hold of it, you can twist so much under the weight of sin that a caregiver becomes a codependent person? See, because now their identity is, I fix things, I fix people. And if I fix you, I no longer have a reason for my identity. And so we have this weird kind of thing of they want to help, they do help, but they help in such a way that the person actually stays stuck in their kind of destructive cycle. And suddenly codependency pops up, and you're like, where did that come from? It actually comes from a good thing. But if you try to make it your identity, sin will twist it. Some of you are, uh, we all do, if you're, if you're a parent, you want to be a good parent, right? That's a good desire. That's a godly desire to be a good parent. But if we make that our identity, my identity is that I am a good parent first and foremost. Sin will twist that and two, one of two things will happen. We will become overbearing to our kids. That is, we will have such harshness and strictness. Why? Well, I'm just trying to be a good parent. I think if it's become your identity, what's really happening is you need your children to be perfect. Why? That's my identity. If my kids fail, I feel like I'm lost, that I'm a failure. We become overbearing, or it can actually go the other way. We become overindulgent. If my identity is a good parent, and you conceive of being a good parent as my kids like me, my kids love to be around me, well, guess what that means? I have to be overindulgent. I can't correct them because I can't bear their disapproval. If my kids disapprove of me, if they're not happy with me, I feel lost because our identity has become a, being a good parent. I saw this, and these are good things. It's a good, if you have a bumper sticker and it says, I, I have an honor roll student, you know, my kid is an honor roll student at such and such at school here or wherever. I see them all over the place. Those are good things. You should do that. I saw another one that says, my kid can beat up your honor roll student. And I, I saw, well, th this guy is saying, I know I can't feel good about myself as a parent because of my kid's academics. I'm going to feel good about it. He can beat up anybody. Somewhere along the lines, our, our identity becomes the very good thing that God intended, but it gets twisted, it gets distorted. Maybe you say, I want to be a good worker. I want to be a success at what I do, whatever it is, farmer, banker, teacher, nurse, doctor, whatever it is, pastor, whatever it is, but suddenly, if it's your identity, if you make it, that's how I know I'm going to be, you have to succeed. And what that usually means, sin is going to twist it and say, hey, it doesn't matter if you've got to work 80 hours a week. You do that all the time, as often as you need to. Why? Because you can't feel good about yourself unless you're a success with your work. And that's why it becomes, it's painful, it's unbearable sometimes when we see when you can't, when you can no longer work, when you suddenly, your body won't let you keep working. And why is that? It's not just hard. It becomes devastating for people, and they can't retire, and they can't take a vacation. They don't take a day off. Why? Because my identity is that, and if I can't do that, I don't know who I am. See how sin will take a good thing, because God wants you to be an excellent worker, but he doesn't want you to take that as your identity. I don't care if it's a scholar, an athlete, a scholar athlete, whatever it is, a good Christian. I'm always, it's always funny to me, though, even when we talk about this, we say, yeah, I just want to be a good Christian. That's my idea. I want to be a good Christian. And even that, sin can take and twist. Jesus once got 72 of his disciples, and he sent them out. He said, look, guys, 
I'm going to put you in some leadership roles. You're going to go out, you're going to preach, and you are going to heal, and you're going to cast out demons. And the 72, it says in the Gospels, go out, and when they come back, they are pumped. I mean, they are full of joy, and they say to Jesus, they say, Jesus, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus right away gives a quick word of caution. He says, careful, careful, fellas. Don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You see the difference, though. What does it take to get your name written in heaven? Well, Jesus, I didn't have to do anything for that. You did all the work. It's not by works. It's by grace. And so I received that as a gift. And so I, I, I can't really take any credit or pride or identity in that, can I? Because you did it for me. And Jesus is like, see how you can even have sin twist trying to be a good Christian because you will say, I, I repent better than anybody. And I, I do this as a commitment to God, but I'm the best possible Christian. And sin will take anything, any good thing and try to twist it. Moses, I think, is at this point. The truth is, if I live, those three lies, if I live by what I have, then I will die when I lose it. If my identity is what I have, when I lose it, I die. If we live by what I can accomplish, then we will die when we fail. If we live by the praise of others, we will die by their criticism and their rejection. There's a difference between having it hurt. It always hurts. It never feels good. There's a difference between that and actually being devastated where you don't know who you are anymore. Well, where do you get true identity? It comes from God. When Moses tries to intervene, one of the Hebrews says something I think deeper than he even maybe thought himself here, but it's very interesting. Moses, why are you guys fighting? And, and the Egyptian says, well, who made you ruler and judge over us? I mean, in our language, you could say, you know, who do you think you are? But he actually puts it in the terms of who made you? That's a good question. Who made you and your identity? Who made you? There's a, a, some true story, but back when George W. Bush was president, there was some initiative, and, and he was visiting nursing homes because of some initiative they were doing. There was a photo ops and all that kind of stuff. But he was in the nursing home, and he was just visiting with some of the residents at the nursing home. And he came to an elderly man who was there at the nursing home. He's sitting, and he bends down, and he says to the elderly man, he says, do you know who I am? And the elderly man looked up at him. He says, no, I don't. But if you ask one of the nurses, they'll tell you. <laughs> Which is pretty good advice. If you don't know who you are, you should ask someone who knows, right? That's really the essence of it here. How do we know who we are? How does God give us an identity? He does it by telling us. And you say, well, that's, that's not much if he's just saying it. But you have to understand, God, when he speaks, it is always always, always connected to his action. God never speaks without acting on it. The Bible trains, trains us in this from the very beginning. You start reading Genesis and it says what? And God said, let there be light, and it was so. And then it just keeps going on and on. And God said, and it was so. And God said, and it was so, because right from the very beginning, God says, when you hear me speak, it's not like other people who can say stuff and it never happens and it doesn't really mean anything. When God says something, it is always attached, always to the truth of his action. And so when God says, I will tell you who you are, I will give you your identity, it's not just the, the, well, he's just telling me something. E even on a sociological level, we know this. You see this stuff happen all the time where we say the power of what happens when someone speaks into your life, especially when they do it repeatedly, that you know this to be true. I mean, just for instance, this, this is a little stretch of your imagination. Assume for a moment that you think 
that I am the most handsome guy on the planet, okay? So just go with me for a second here. I mean, seriously, if you really believe that, and every time that I came to be with you here or throughout the week, whenever I saw you, you couldn't help but say to me, oh, man, Cliff, I wish I had a nose that big. I mean, I just wish. It's the, you are so good looking. I mean, it must be so nice. You could take your hands off the steering wheel and still steer. How nice, nice would that be to have a nose that big? And Cliff, if only I could have ears that big that double as kind of a beach umbrella. That would be so fantastic. It's so amazing. You're just amazingly good looking. And, you know, if only I could have such a powerfully receding hairline like you do, Cliff. I mean, that would be awesome. If you guys said to that to me every day, and that's all I ever heard from you, how long do you think it would take for the power of your words to start to sink in such that when I get up in the morning and I get to the mirror, I'm going, it's a pretty good looking guy right here, you know? How do I know that? Everybody tells me that. Now, that's from flawed, messed up people like ourselves. What happens if the one true holy God who has never lied cannot lie in his very nature? He cannot lie. And when he speaks, he always attaches it to his actions, looks at you and says, you are amazing. I love you so much. Do you have any idea how incredible you are? I made you. And I made you in my image. You have intellect. You have will. You have passions and desires that I have put into you that I have put into no other part of my creation in the same way that I put it into you. You are fantastic. Now, if you say, well, gosh, if I could hear God say that to me every day, that would be pretty cool. Do you see why? We really don't care that you read your Bible so that you get head knowledge and you run the table on some game show for you know all the Bible knowledge, why we want you to read it over and over and over and over again is so that you can hear what God is truly saying about you. Because what he says about you is the truth about your identity. You are a daughter of the king. You are a son of the king. You belong to him. Your identity is set in him. It's not manufactured by someone else. It's not manufactured by you. And when you hear these other voices, and I do, I mean, don't lock me away yet, but I hear other voices, and the other voices are always what? But if they knew, you are a screw-up. You always fall short. If people knew the darkness in your heart, they would not think of you that way. And the voices that you hear that are beating yourself down. I'm not worth anything. Nobody wants me. I've proven that by so many experiences in my life. It must be true that I'm not worth anything. I'm just dirt. And those voices, we hear those. And somewhere along the line where it comes, where God, I want to hear your voice more than any other voice because that's the voice that will absolutely solidify my identity. I mean, I'm not against, don't get me wrong, I I watch TV too, but I've never really ever come away from a TV or from a a movie saying, boy, I really feel really good about myself, you know? I mean, I really feel like that spoke into my life. You feel good about the hero, you feel, oh, that's a good story, that's really interesting, that's fantastic, but you never really hear. I'm saying we at some point have to take seriously if I'm going to have my identity grounded in such a way that it is impervious to all of these other forces that will twist and distort, I have got to hear God's voice regularly, every day. And if you say, well, I don't think God speaks that way, I, I don't think you understand the scriptures then. Yeah, but Cliff, it doesn't feel like God loves me when I sin. And some of you have a picture of God's love. He loves you, loves you, loves you. You sin, he stops loving you. And then you kind of come back around after a while and you're well, I guess he starts loving me again and then I sin and he stops loving me. And he doesn't work that way. Why do I always quote Romans 5.8? It's one of the greatest verses to me in all the Bible because it says, God demonstrates his love in this way. While we were yet sinners, at my worst, while I'm a sinner, not after I get my act all together and cleaned up. While I'm a sinner, Christ died for me. God loves us in our sin. 
I'm not trying to say he doesn't care about the sin. I'm saying his love does not diminish. It does not stop. Not for a second has God stopped loving you. But you and I have heard a lot of other voices. And our identity is being drawn from those other things. I see it in the way that Jesus himself was blessed by God. By the way, what's the first thing, if you go back to Genesis, what's the first thing that God did after he made male and female? Genesis 1. You're like, well, what did, what, he put him in the garden, he gave him a command, what did he do? The very first thing, Genesis 1.28 says, God made them male and female in God's image. He made them male and female, and then it says, and God blessed them. Now, a lot of people think, well, does that mean like they procreated and they're going to have lots of kids? Yeah, that's part of it. But you know what the biggest part of it is? He blessed them. He speaks into them. You are my child. You are completely loved by me. That's what it means to be blessed by God, to hear that voice like Jesus did. The very Son of God himself who comes like one of us has to be born like one of us and grow up like us. And before he gets into his full-blown ministry, he remember he's baptized by John the Baptist? And at that baptism, what happens? The Spirit comes down like a dove, and a voice from the heavens says, This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I'm well pleased. And somebody could say, um, just point of clarification, Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't taught, no big sermon on the mount yet. He hasn't healed anybody, hasn't cast out any demons. He hasn't done anything. Do you see that's the point? He's not having his identity based on what he does. It's based on the blessing of the Father who says, you're my son. And so when we hear God say, you're my son and my daughter, that we begin to hear his blessing and the freedom. Jesus was most free of any human being who ever lived, free in his identity. You know why? Because he was free to be fully surrendered to the purposes of God and to trust the Father to lift him up, not himself. He was free to tell the truth and be rejected for it. He was free to love the outcasts and be unpopular for it. He was free to be misunderstood and not be consumed with anxiousness over that. He was free to die for sinners who might never, ever respond to what he had done for them. He's the most free person. You're like, well, that's good for Jesus. Do you realize every time you see something in Jesus, that's what God intends for you and me? If you see that freedom in Jesus and you're like, boy, I wish I could be like that. Being able to go through life and yet yeah, still hurts, but to find that, that kind of solid foundation, I can accept and receive criticism and rejection and be okay. I can fail and be okay because I know who I really am. Can I just say the, the, the key to this is humility? Moses is humbled by the time he gets to the end of our text here when he gets to Midian in the desert wilderness we're not there yet but humility is the way humility is the pathway to receive our identity he's humbled he gets to this point where gosh i i don't know who i am i am he says it in the line i'm a foreigner in a foreign land i have no clue who i am anymore because i tried to create my identity and nobody really received it and in fact there is a slight change here though because when he gets to midian and he serves trying to be the rescuer again But he does it in a new way. He's not dependent on the response of those he helps. And you know this is true because the seven gals get help from him, and then what do they do? Well, they blow him off. They go home. This is fantastic. We go home earlier than we've ever gotten home. Dad says, how come you guys are home so early? Some guy helped us. He looked like an Egyptian. I don't know. He helped us. And he's like, and you didn't didn't thank him? You You didn't invite him in for hospitality? You didn't somehow reciprocate what he had done with kindness? Well, no, we didn't really think to do that. Which means that Moses helped again, got completely rejected and blown off, and he doesn't lose it. He doesn't blow a gasket. I could see Moses if it was me. You know, I filled their water troughs and like, man, not even a thank you. And if I had Moses' explosive anger, I'd be like, I'm I'm turning the water back over. I'm saying, hey, shepherds, let's teach these gals a lesson in gratitude, right? You guys come back in over here and we're gonna push them out and I will never help you guys again because I got nothing from you. He helps, they leave, and he's okay. And now God blesses him, but he knows, look, this is a God I can trust. I didn't think I got anything out of serving and helping, and now God blesses. I'm counting on God's blessing, not to create it myself. 
If you feel like a failure today, can I tell you that that is the best place to be? Because God, even God, cannot resurrect someone who hasn't died. And to die to ourself means to die to me trying to create my identity and working so hard at it. And dying to that, you are in the perfect place to be raised from the dead. And God does it. God is the one who says, Moses, I'm going to take you, and I know this seems impossible, but you are going to be a rescuer. You are going to be a person I'm going to use against the oppressor. But here's the twist now, Moses, the good twist. God is going to be the one who destroys the oppressor, not you. And Moses, you will be a mediator. You're going to be a great mediator, but you are going to have a humbleness about your own sin as you mediate for your brothers and your sisters. And Moses, you, you are going to be used by God in tremendous ways to lead a people to new life. But guess what? God is going to get all the glory. Can you live with that? Because guess what? That's what you and I were made for, to live for his glory. And it doesn't mean you miss out on anything. It means you are fulfilling the very purpose that God has given you in the first place. And there is no better place to be than in the center of his will. Let's pray. Lord, give, we give thanks. <clears throat> we give thanks because you are good. We, uh, we miss that a lot. We don't recognize um, what you're doing always in our lives, but thank you for making us aware of how our sin will twist, make us twist in the wind over trying to make ourselves. But God, you made us. You're the only one who can make us a new creation. And we... We are grateful that you've done all that is necessary for us to do that. What a great sign of your love. If we ever doubt it, God, tell us again, speak into our lives that today, this very day again, you rejoiced over us with singing, that the God of the universe is singing our name in love. And God, we've heard so many lies in our hearts. Our hearts are, are skeptical. It's hard for us to believe this kind of love. Would you break through that right now? Would, would you really just overwhelm us with this love that changes us, changes the way that we live? And I pray this happens, God, again, so that you get the credit, you get the glory. That's what we're made for. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship our God. I want to encourage you, um, if you feel that kind of sense that the Holy Spirit wants you to pray about something, this is the time to do it. We're going to be available at the doors here. Don't hesitate. Just come on out and pray with us. We treasure that time with you. Otherwise, let's stand and let's sing together. Our God is worthy of...